Okay, in this video I'd like to discuss uh, hemoglobin a little deeper and its relation to enzymes and kind of how a lot of courses use hemoglobin and myoglobin as sort of the protein, model proteins to start looking and talking about enzymes. So what I have here is just a b bunch of information about hemoglobin that I prepared and um, the first part says that hemoglobin is a typical allosteric protein and exhibits many of the same features we see in enzymes. But hemoglobin is not an enzyme. So remember, hemoglobin is not an enzyme, but it is a protein. It is a multi-subunit protein, and it's an allosteric protein. So what do I mean by an allosteric protein? Well, in, when we talk about enzymes, allosteric proteins, or an allosteric enzyme, is um, capable of binding small molecules, so small ligands, um, at a site other than the active site. And this causes some sort of conformational change in the enzyme. Um, usually in the quaternary or tertiary structure, some sort of conformational change. Uh, in the case of hemoglobin, it will be in the quaternary structure. There will be a conformational change, and it will result in a decreased affinity or an increased affinity. So allosteric, allosterics are usually divided into two categories. So they are either allosteric inhibitors, which um, decrease the, act, the binding capacity, or they're allosteric activators, which actually facilitate binding of what it, whatever that substrate is in the case of an enzyme or in the case of hemoglobin here, oxygen. Because that's what we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about oxygen and the um, capacity to bind oxygen or the ability to, or the affinity for hemoglobin for oxygen. So that's what I mean when, I, when I'm talking about al an allosteric protein. It can bind some sort of small ligand to a site other than the histidine F8 where the um, oxygen binds. So it'll bind to a place other than where the oxygen binds and it will cause uh, some sort of conformational change that will affect the way hemoglobin binds oxygen. So the next part here I say when oxygen binds to the heme group a conformational change occurs that results in different quaternary structure. The two beta chains are much closer to each other in the oxygenated form. Now, now that makes perfect sense. This is not talking about an allosteric. I'm talking about just oxygen binding at histidine F8 on the hemoglobin at the heme group um, and changing the conformation. And remember I said before that hemoglobin shows this cooperative binding. And cooperative binding means that once one oxygen binds, it facilitates the ability for the next oxygen to bind, which makes it easier for the next oxygen to bind, and if finally the fourth oxygen, it's very easy for that fourth ox oxygen to bind to hemoglobin. So that makes perfect sense that the two beta chains are, are much closer to each other in the oxygenated form because remember I said that it's sort of like these groups, once one changes its conformation, it induces a conformational change in the next chain. So that makes perfect sense. And I just wanted to use that as a lead into talking about the actual ligands and how that's going to change. So other ligands can affect oxygen binding. It can affect the oxygen binding curve. Both H plus and CO2 bind to hemoglobin at a site other than the heme group. This should say end. End alters the three dimensional structure in some little but important ways. So other ligands can affect oxygen bind, the oxygen binding curve. H plus and CO2 bind it to hemoglobin at a site other than the heme group and alters the three-dimensional structure in, a sub, in some little but important ways. So the effect of H plus on the, oxygen bind, on the oxygen binding in hemoglobin is known as the Bohr effect. So that you'll want to remember, I kind of underlined it here. So the effect of H plus on oxygen binding in hemoglobin is known as the Bohr effect. You'll want to remember that name. I believe Bohr was Niles Bohr's father. He was very famous also in the physics community, um, his son. And this is his father. An increase in the concentration of H plus reduces the, ox reduces the oxygen affinity of hemoglobin. So what I mean by that is as, the, as more protons or as the environment becomes more acidic, thus the pH is, is decreasing. So the pH is decreasing, more hydrogen ions are going to be available this is going to favor the deoxygenated form of hemoglobin. So it, decreases, it reduces the oxygen affinity of hemoglobin. Increasing H plus causes protonation of key amino acids. Now this is the details as to how this actually works. So, so, why, does, so why does binding of, of H plus to hemoglobin change the uh, binding affinity? And basically the reason for that is right here. Um, 
Increasing H plus causes pertination of key amino acids, including the N terminal of alpha chains and the histi and histidine 146 of the beta chains. The pertinated histidine is attracted to and stabilized by a salt bridge at ASP94. This favors this favors or stabilizes I should say stabilizes. This favors or stabilizes the deoxygenated form of hemoglobin. So that makes sense because remember histidine 146 at physiological pH 7.4 we're talking about histidine is going to have its proton removed because it loses a proton at about six but it's kind of right on that cusp of you know being protonated and not being protonated at physiological pH so we can assume that if this becomes protonated like we're talking about by H plus here so a proton is going to protonate this this is going to become positively charged then and if we recall, ASP, ASP is aspartic acid, and that has a negative charge at physiological pH. It's perfectly reasonable to see that this positive charge and this negative charge are going to form an ionic interaction. And that's what they mean by stabilized by a salt bridge. And that stabilization of the salt by the salt bridge actually favors the deoxygenated form. It stabilizes the deoxygenated form, and that's exactly what I'm getting at here. Is that this is going to this interaction, this protonation of histidine 146 and the salt bridge formed with aspartic 90, aspartic acid 94, is going to is going is going to stabilize the deoxygenated form. So it's going to make it more stable. And that's basically what I said at the end here. I said this makes sense because actively metabolizing tissue, which requires oxygen. So remember, you're exercising or whatever. You're running on the treadmill or lifting weights or something. And, um, you know, you require, you require oxygen at that point. It will also release H+, decreasing the pH of the local environment. So that, may, that makes perfect sense because you're, you're going to be creating like things like lactic acid is going to be building up in the muscles and that's going to be creating a higher concentration of H plus in the local environment. So if the, this condition will favor the release of oxygen where it is needed. So in order to see this visually, which will probably be required to do at some point or another, and, and, and also as a disclaimer, I didn't say this before, but myoglobin, remember myoglobin is not a, a, a tetra it does not have four subunits. It only has, it's one subunit. It is not affected by hydrogen ions or CO2 concentrations. But hemoglobin is. And we talked about this characteristic S-shaped curve. So now you might be saying, well, well, what happens when the pH decreases? What happens as the pH decreases to this curve? Well, essentially, really, it's not all that difficult. The, gra the curve just gets shifted further and further to the right. So as we're going along here, this is just going to keep getting shifted further and further to the right. So if this is like pH 7.4 and maybe this is pH 7.2 and maybe I'll draw another one in a different color to kind of talk about it here. So again we have another curve shifted over here so this is maybe pH equal to 7 and that's just the way it's going to be. It's going to just keep going on in this fashion. We're going to keep shifting the curve. Same thing here in pink. And shift the curve over here. And in pink, we're going to say maybe that's pH of, I don't know, 6.8. Okay? So that's all that's going to happen. It's just going to keep shifting over to the right. And you might say to me now, why? Why is it shifting to the right? Well, remember what I said about this. This is going to favor the deoxygenated form. And we have some actively respiring tissue. We're, we're exercising, we're working out, whatever. And we need oxygen. So, of course, as we're increasing this hydrogen ion, or proton ion concentration, protons, this concentration of protons, we're going to want to release oxygen easier and easier. So what this curve is saying here is that it's harder and harder to bind oxygen, harder and harder to bind oxygen at as the it's harder and harder to bind oxygen here because we're shifting the curve to the right so more and more oxygen pressure is needed in order to get oxygen to bind to hemoglobin but the trade-off and the important part here and the big and the big picture here the trade-off is that it's much much easier to release oxygen which in this case the important part is not so much the binding of oxygen because up here at 100 tor you know over here at 100 tor, you know, this high pressure that's found in the lungs, 
you're going to bind oxygen, of course, in the lungs here. It's not going to make a difference. But since you need this oxygen in the tissue, and, and you need it desperately in this case, you're going to want to release it easier and easier. So the upshot here is it's harder to bind oxygen initially, but it's much, much easier to release it in the tissue where it's needed. And that's, and that's really the upshot. So I'll move on to the last part here where I just wanted to briefly talk about two more molecules that can bind to hemoglobin and alter its, um, alter its binding curve, oxygen binding curve, or change its affinity for oxygen. So I said large amounts of CO2 are produced by metabolism. The presence of large amounts of H plus as a result of CO2 production favors the quaternary structure of deoxygenated hemoglobin. So all I'm saying in this sentence is that the deoxygenated hemoglobin is stabilized by the presence of H plus and CO2. And remember, the H plus, we talked about it, it's at histidine 146 and aspartate um, 94 that form that salt bridge that stabilizes it, stabilizing interaction. The CO2, in turn, forms carbonic acid. So we might remember carbonic acid. I did some videos previously on, um, on the pH and, and um, buffer solution problems using carbonic acid and blood, pH and blood buffer systems. So check those out if you're interested. Um, which is deprotonated at physiological pH. So what I'm saying here is that it doesn't exist in this acidic form. It actually exists as HCO3 minus. So what that means is that most of the dissolved CO2 will exist as HCO3 minus. Okay? And the HCO3 minus is transported to the lungs where it picks up a hydrogen or a proton released when hemoglobin is oxygenated. So when this thing, when this HCO3, this, this reaches the lungs. It actually becomes protonated by the H plus because remember what I said, even though it's very, very difficult to bind oxygen over here, I said it's very, very difficult to bind oxygen here. At 100 torr here, at, at the pressure that you're going to find in the lungs, you're still going to bind oxygen and you're going to readily bind it. So this releases the proton, which is picked up, which is, which is then picked up and produces H2CO3. So the H plus is released by hemoglo when hemoglo hemoglobin is oxygenated, producing H2CO3. In turn, the H2CO3 liberates CO2, which is exhaled. So that's how, that's how the CO2 gets out of the lungs. That's how you get rid of it. So in turn, the H2CO3 liberates CO2, which is, which is exhaled. And this allows for fine tuning and control of CO2 pH and oxygen levels. And that's a lot of what you're going to see with enzymes. It's going to be the same sort of stuff. Um, you're going to see all these different small molecules that are allosteric inhibitors, allosteric, um, allosteric um, activators that are going to bind to these different enzymes and alter, either increase or decrease their ability to bind the substrate. And that's, and that's what this is sort of leading to and what I'm trying to say here. And I also wanted to bring up one more important one. This one you might, you probably need more details than I'm giving you here f for your exams and such, but it's worth just talking about briefly. I said hemoglobin also binds 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, or no, better known as 2,3-BPG, with drastic effects on the oxygen binding capacity. So BPG is what gives hemoglobin's oxygen binding curve its characteristic sigmoidal shape. If BPG were not present, hemoglobin would bind oxygen much tighter and appear more like myoglobin. So what I'm saying by that is that this, two, this presence of this 2,3-BPG molecule is, is actually what allow, gives, ox, gives um, hemoglobin its ability to um, release the oxygen and act as an oxygen transport protein and not as an oxygen um, storage protein. So what gives this characteristic S shape here so for hemoglobin here, this sort of characteristic S shape here is actually the presence of 2,3-BPG. So this is, you know, plus 2,3-BPG. And this over here, if it didn't have 2,3-BPG, it would look more like that. You know, it would be more hyperbolic. It would look a lot like myoglobin. I mean, this is a little sloppy here. These should be closer together and such. But you get the point. I'm just trying, all I'm trying to say here is that the presence of 2,3-BPG allows this to act as an oxygen transport protein and not as an oxygen storage protein like myoglobin. So this is what actually gives it this sort of characteristic S shape.